we had uh, two equilibrium points. And I did the analysis for the simple one, which was this one. So S star, I star is equal to tau zero. And I gave you a bunch of eigenvalues. And basically, I said that this point is a saddle if beta is greater than b over. So that's why I left you last time. And then I said we will do the second equilibrium point today, which is a nightmare, as you're about to find out. So, equilibrium point two. So, in other words, to determine this stability, but it's a nightmare, as you can see. And this often happens, see, and this is the point I made last class to a bunch of you. The dimension of the dynamical system is not a problem, but it's three dimensions, four dimensions. It's how many free parameters you have that give you the issue. So, because the eigenvalues become extremely complicated, and determine their stability, determine their size, becomes 
a very arduous process. So, what do we do? Do we just stop them? Do we just simplify them? Do we simplify them? This is using the simplifier. Yes. So, it was not simplified. This is after using simplifier. So, do we just stop? No, we cannot do this. So, for two by two systems, there's a bit of a trick, actually. And let me explain to you. But this trick I'm about to show you only works for two by two. So, in general, if this was a three by three system, you would have no choice but to put this into some algebra system and to see what size this is less than. So this trick now only applies for two by two systems. Okay. And let me explain. Because we're right now stuck at determining our stability properties because we don't know the signs of the diameter. So this trick is called, it's not a trick, it's a theory of I call it a trick because it only works in two dimensions. It's called the trace determinant. So in two by two systems, when you have multiple parameters like this, and you do not want to analyze or even compute these eigenvalues. Yes? Plain. 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 And even computing these eigenvalues is very difficult because you have to solve the characteristic polynomial too. So you don't want to do this. So let me go back to our simple case. Supposing I just have some matrix A with entries A, B, C, and D. In general, the eigenvalues of this are given by what? They're given by the characteristic polynomial, which is lambda squared minus A plus D lambda plus A, D minus B, C, D, C. So that's the character after some simple but in general, this is the characteristic polynomial that will determine the eigenvalues of this matrix. But notice that we have two very special terms in here. What is this term? If you look at this matrix, what is A plus D? Um, what is that? Trace. Okay, so this is the trace of it. And what is AD minus BC? So in other words, the eigenvalues are a function of the trace of the matrix and its determinant. Let's see what that tells us. Only for uh, only for two by three. Because in three by three you have extra cofactors and the formula doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've established that there's a trace and a determinant. So let me then write it in terms of that. So lambda minus trace A lambda plus determinant A is equal to C. And now I can solve for lambda because it's just a quadratic equation. So this implies that lambda, I'll call it 1 and 2, is equal to 1 half trace A plus or minus square root of trace A squared minus four times determinant A. So those are the eigenvalues for any two by two matrix. Okay. And in particular, we have interesting properties. Namely that if I add lambda one plus lambda two, I get trace of A, as you can confirm. And if I multiply lambda one times lambda 2, I get the determinant. So the sum of the eigenvalues is the trace. The multiplication of the eigenvalues is the determinant. Okay. So now out of sheer laziness, because I don't want to write TR and DT every time, I will denote by T trace A and by D determinant A. Because I don't want to keep writing. Yes. 
Yeah, I know too. Yeah, I, I did bring it Okay. Now what can we say? Well, in particular, we have now a bunch of cases that we can analyze the signs of these eigenvalues purely in terms of the signs of the trace on these things. So in particular, the eigenvalues are one possibility is that they're complex with non-zero imaginary costs. Which will occur if this factor goes to less than zero. In other words, if t squared minus 4 eight is less than two. <laughs> Another possibility is that the eigenvalues are real and distinct just by looking at, as usual, the sign of the square root. So this case would be if t squared minus 4d is greater than 0. And of course, the third case is your favorite case, with real and repeated rules. And this will be, of course, when t squared minus 4 is equal to 0. And that's why we call it the trace determinant plane, because the entire geometry of this 2 by 2 system is determined by tt. So if you were to sketch d and t and the different values, you get a parabola. So depending on which side of the parabola you are on the plane, that's the sign of the argument. So this saves you from having to compute eigenvalues. And you can just look at the signs of the eigenvalues just by looking at the trace of the Jacobian and the determinant of the Jacobian. But there's more we can say about this actually. That will be even more helpful to you. In particular, so breaking this down further, We have some subcases of these. So let me take the first subcase, which is if it's less than zero. So if t squared minus 40 is less than zero, the real part of this is going to be t over 2. The real part of my eigenvalue will be, of course, just a half t. So remember, we analyze stabilities by looking at the real parts of the eigenvalues. So to analyze stability of my Jacobian, all I need to look is the sign of t over 2, which is a trace divided by t. So I'll show you this in an example, or our own example. So in particular, but these are still complex. So we have a C, if t is less than 0. <coughs> we have a source, if t is greater than 0, as you know by now. And a saddle, or a center, I should say, because these are complex, if t is equal to 0. So that's where the general case of the complex are. So you can see we can determine same source and center behavior just by looking at the sign of the trace, which is incredibly useful. But I will not respect this to a theorem because it only works in two dimensions. And it gives you false hope. Many sleepless nights of those though, actually. So, but for our purposes, it's okay, because everything we've been doing so far has been too much. So, it's okay. Okay, the second case, which is the greater than zero. So, these are when the eigenvalues are purely real. So, if d is less than zero, which is the determinant, you get a saddle. And why is this? Because d is the determinant, it's lambda 1 times lambda 2. So the only way for you to be less than 0 is if 1 is negative and 1 is positive. Right? So d is equal to lambda 1 times lambda 2, and the only way this
this can be less than zero, is if lambda 1, 2 are of different styles. Obviously. Okay. If, so that's one case. If B is less than zero, and further we have this implies that T squared is less than T squared minus 14. So what happens if you factor? What happens? What is the implications of this inequality? So T squared oops, less than T squared minus 4D. This implies that plus or minus T is less than the square root of t squared minus 4. Just by square root of 4. Okay. So, in particular, we have t plus square root of t squared minus 4 d, which is greater than 0. Or we have that t minus square root of t squared minus 4 d is less than 0. So now we can say, based on this, that if the determinant is positive, and the trace is negative, then both of these are less than zero. T plus and minus are less than zero. So if both are less than zero, lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is less than zero. That means you have the same. So, this implies that you have a C if T is less than zero and B is greater than zero. Because both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are minus, so the determinant would be positive and the trace would be negative. And you have a source if the opposite is true. If T is greater than zero, and B is So this will help us tremendously now determine the stability and actually finish this boring disease model in okay. okay. So I think I've erased the Jacobian here, oops. But you know it, I've written it down. And now I have trouble. So now, if I want to determine the stability properties of this point too, I can just apply this trace determinant stuff to my new okay. minus mu, mu plus beta tau, divided by b plus mu. And this will always be less than zero if that assumption I wrote down before, that the population must be positive, if beta is greater than b. And of course, we also are assuming that b mu is greater than so our trace is always negative, no matter what. So this implies that both of my eigenvalues are negative. Or less than zero. So in fact, this point, point number two, is what then? <coughs> sin, very good. Point two is a sin. But now, go back two classes ago, I think. If both eigenvalues, and there's only two eigenvalues of this system, both of them are negative, what else can we say about this system? In addition to that, the same. What else can I say? What 
type of stable. Asymptotically stable. Very good. And what is that theorem called? Okay. Okay. Okay, so the other one. Wow. He said he said it's the theorem of asymptotic stability. That was Jared's answer. It's very good. <laughs> I'm sure there are some American textbooks that follow that. Yes. So, not only is it a local sig, but also by the Leopoldov's stability theorem. Point two is also asymptotic state. This means that all of the orbits in a neighborhood of point two, as time goes to infinity, over a long time, will approach this point, will converge to this point. That's what, uh, that is the difference between stable and asymptotic state. Question? P2 is point two. I didn't want to read it. The equilibrium question. Right. Equilibrium. Question. So um, I don't know when this was, but a few lectures ago, you said how if you let's say you have a set and then um, you apply the flow operator to it, and if it does not leave, if it does not leave that set, mm -hmm. then it's called something. Uh, in very it is invariant. Mm -hmm. So in this case, because um, let's say a small region around the would that be an invariant? Yes, because the equilibrium point itself is an invariant. Okay. Yes. So any orbit will be sharp. Yes. But so it's asymptotic is it? And it's a sig. So this means that, well, let me write it. So this is a very special state of the system. Because over time, all of the states will approach this if you set beta to have this value to be in. So this is a point I wanted to make that is often missed in dynamical systems. Um, the parameter choices are your choices. Either you determine them from data, so you hire some stats guy to do regressions for you. And then they figure out what these coefficients are supposed to be. And then you put them in your system and you see what happens. But often, there's no justification for why people pick the values they do. And this is true in physics, in cosmology in particular. Because I guess an example way to think of this is, and this is an example I like a lot, if you have a ball, let's say, on top of some hill, and you roll it, the dynamics of this ball is completely determined by using the laws of motion, right? Okay. So you know that. Once the ball starts moving, it's completely deterministic by laws of physics. But what is not determined by the physics or the equations is where you start the load from. The so-called initial condition. Or the initial parameter. So this is often missed in many classes, many courses. So this is, in some sense, your choice. Once you set up the problem, then physics takes over. But the problem is that what is the justification for this? So in biology, it makes sense, in some sense, because you have data of diseases and how fast they spread and things like this that will allow you to determine these parameters up to a certain degree of accuracy, because that's also a statistic. But this is often missed. So that's why you have to study things like bifurcations and things like this, which I will do. Question? So by initial condition, you refer to a set of divergent values? Yes. And economists are famous for doing this, actually. They have no justification whatsoever for the values of reference they choose. But I will control my time. They don't want to get this job. In fact, I think I burned every bridge <laughs> with every non math in this university. Um, yeah. I can't help it. One day you're going to go to the doctor, and they're going to see one of your lectures. Oh, biology is useless, right? My sister is a biologist. You can imagine the dynamics in our home. She thinks physics is stupid, and I think biology is stupid. Are the dynamics um, dynamical? <laughs>
Exactly the same steps I did for the SIR model. The linearized system becomes what? It becomes S prime is equal to minus mu s plus minus tau beta minus mu i and the i prime linearized equation at this point is minus v plus tau beta. So now we just look where this becomes zero. So remember our language, how we talk about these things. We say the following. We see that S destabilizes this equilibrium. When, what happens when mu is equal to tau, which is equal to zero? That's one possibility. Further, now we look at the i prime equation. We see that i destabilizes. this equilibrium point, when minus v plus tau beta is equal to zero. Or, if we solve this equation or rewrite it, it means that when tau is equal to v over beta. So there's that cascade v over beta factor. And now I will give you a name for it, fine. Tau represents the total population. Remember this? That's what I call tau. Yes? I cannot continue if you do not recall this. It won't make any sense what I say now. So the total population bifurcates when V over beta is equal to tau. So what is this V over beta called? It's called the threshold population. I think that's how you spell it. Threshold level of threshold population. So there's something critical about when the population hits V over V in your model. Something will happen when the population is less than V over beta, something will happen when it's equal to V over beta, and something will happen when it's greater than V over beta. That's what you mean by bifurcation. So in detail, what happens? That's for the first equilibrium point. Now I have to do the bifurcation of the second Yes? It should be V with some weird French accent here. I don't know what happened. It's V. Like, I don't know why I drew a circumflex over the Okay. That's 
That's for the first equilibrium point. We also have to analyze the linearized system about the second equilibrium point. Namely, when S star I star is equal to V over beta, mu tau minus V over beta. V plus V. Okay? And once again, you just look at the Jacobian and write down the linearized system. So the linearized system. is given as follows. S prime is equal to minus mu. So I'm just doing a clean substitution here. Nothing complicated. Times S plus V minus mu minus V minus mu. And then you have the I prime equation. <coughs> you just read this directly off the Jacobian. Nothing complicated. You get mu minus v plus v tau over v plus mu. And now we do the same thing again. We see where s prime and i prime is equal to zero. And it will not be surprising to us. And this was the condition for point two to be a system. In fact, it's asymptotically stable. Okay. So you have some transition then that's taking place. Because it's never a source, right? We proved that. It's only a saddle or it's a same. I mean point one is a saddle. So we have a transition from when t or tau is equal to v over beta, and then when it goes to greater than v over beta. And you see, the stability changes as we change this value. And in fact, in other words, For tau being greater than v over beta, our first point, equilibrium point one, was found to be what type of equilibrium point? The first equilibrium point, the tau zero point. What was it? What were the signs of its eigenvalues? Was it a sink? Was it a source? No, S star I, when it's tau zero, what was it? Saddle. I did write saddle, right? Now I wrote saddle. Asteroid. You have it, saddle? Okay. You wrote it now. Okay. So, for point one, when tau is greater than v over beta, we see that point one becomes a cycle. Okay. 
And for tau greater than V over zero, what does point two become? What is point two? What type of point is point two? Always? Zero. Right? Yes? Do we call this? So, when tau is greater than V over beta, we have two equilibrium points. One is a saddle, one is a sink. But they both exist simultaneously in our space, as side space, for this value of tau. One is a saddle, one is a sink. So what else can we say then, the final conclusion about this dynamical system that connects two distinct equilibrium points? What do we call that, do you remember? Very good. So in fact, with this choice, when tau goes to V over beta, we have a heteroclinic orbit that forms in us. Shouldn't there be one more point then? Why? Because if you said there's a saddle... Sequence. The That's a sequence. Heteroclinic sequence is when you start with source, saddle, and then sink. But a heteroclinic orbit is just an orbit that connects two distinct things. But I'm saying for this system, you have a sinking and a saddle, right? Yeah. So then, isn't the saddle uh, a consequence of having the source here the No. That's, a lot of people are confused about this for some reason. A saddle is when the eigenvalues are different sides. That's its characterization. A source is when all of the eigenvalues are positive, and a sink is when all of the eigenvalues are negative. No, but, okay, so let's, let's say we're talking about like a multi dimensional kind of case. Mm -hmm. Let's say you had some plane that's curved like this, yes. and then it would be like this. Yes. That would be that. That would be, that would be a uh, saddle point, right? The connection of the y yes, right? Yes. So then, would it, that mean that uh, one of the curves could be considered a source because it's pushing outwards, and the other one coming in? Um, be careful. You have to look at the dimension of the unstable, stable manifold. So don't get confused. A saddle, by definition, in any dimension, has some orbits that live in the stable manifold and some that live in the unstable manifold. But that's not the same as having a source for a sink. Because a source has all of the orbits that live in the unstable manifold. A sink has all of the orbits that live in the stable manifold. A saddle has a combination of it. So don't get confused. But in any ways, we have two distinct equilibrium points with two vastly different behaviors, and we call them the heterogeneous orbit. So that's what happens at this bifurcation. And that's what it is. And I'll show you the diagram. And it connects T1 to T2. And what can we say about this in terms of of biological application. So we have no homophilic orbits because we don't have any points that connect to themselves. We do not have that complicated a system. But in conclusion, what we can say is that biologically, this disease, the one we are modeling, is established, that's a good word, <laughs> in this population, when the total population exceeds the threshold level.
all to the file history. So let me show you finally this diagram. Keep downloading and have that time to show you. What is the room in? So what I did was I simulated this dynamical system very simply, and I'll give you the parameters I use. So these are completely junk parameters. They have no physical relevance, but you're reading my emails as well. I suppose so. Uh, just a lot of fights with a lot of people. So this numerical simulation, I used beta is equal to 1, v is equal to 1, mu is equal to 1, and tau is equal to 2. It, they don't mean anything, they're just for numerical illustration. And what you get is you have that 2 equilibrium point. So, which do you think is point 1 and which do you think is point 2? And why is the middle of point 2? And which then is point 1? And you can see the saddle behavior of point one. Because you have a bunch of orbits that approach it, but then they repel by it. You have a bunch of orbits that approach it, they repel by it. And over time, all of the orbits go to point two. So it's asymptotically stable. So this is what's happening in the system. So you start with your population that has no disease, right? Point one is not less disease. And eventually, all of the population goes towards the exceeding the threshold. That's why it's called Exactly. Every single orbit approaches that point. No, it does get there. It converges to it. So that is the difference between a center and a sink. A sink has convergence to that point. A center just keeps orbiting around, but never does. Asymptotic, so in dynamical systems, asymptotic means as time goes to infinity. So in that asymptotic sense, every orbit will converge to that point. But over a very long time. So you said it was heteroclinic, right? Yeah, so you see all of these orbits that are joining. Maybe it's poorly drawn, but all of these orbits are joining point one to point two. There's a bunch that do. There's supposed to be a lot more, but mathematics are lot. Heteroclinic doesn't mean that, okay, it just means um, there's no like other direction that goes back to the other one? That's a whole other thing. So, heteroclinic means I have some point here, I have some point too, and they're connected by some curve. That but, but I mean, like, you know how in like, uh, like graphs, I mean, a directed graph? So, like, this one you said everything is going towards the center? Yes. So, it, so homoclinic doesn't necessarily mean there's something. Back, like an old Homo does, not hetero. Hetero, I mean hetero is just making some kind of connection. Exactly, some connection in your face space that connects point one to point two. This is hetero, because it's too distinct. Yeah. If it was like this, then it would be a homo. Oh, okay. So our circles that we have for the rock, paper, scissors, those are a series of homo things. If you start at, if your equilibrium point, lies along the orbit, but in that case it will not. Okay. So it says it will not. Um, in, no, they are not. It's actually exponential. Right. Yes? So as topically stable means it will never be centered. Say it again? As topically stable means it will never... It will converge. Okay, well, so you see, it's converging to point two. All the orbits <laughs> are converging to that point. So it's asymptotically stable. So if you were to describe the behavior of the global, you would say it's the same? For global? You'd say, in fact, that this is an attractor. Point two is an attractor. We didn't do too much global because I don't want you not to worry about finding limit sets and only if you want to do it, we can do it. No, but it's, it's much harder to prove global because you have to use the, uh, the solid invariant. Well, I wrote down. Yes? Yes, yes. This one. This one you want. Because one is definitely a cell. 
So your global future attractor will always be in terms of the same. Any questions about this? Yes? Access I'm missing here. But you can easily get it because you can write down with the archive. So that is the disadvantage of reducing the dimensional system. You get some missing information, but you can always get it. But the dynamics are entirely described. Any questions about it? Okay, so um, see what